and how can you present that as legal property? Thank you, Sana. You know more about my personal affairs than my tax accountant or I do. When you find those Swiss millions, do bring them to me. I was indeed born to a privileged family and to a wealthy family. In fact, three of us were undergraduates at Harvard together without scholarships. So if three of us could afford to come to Harvard as undergraduates, I'm sure we could afford to go and stay in exile too. I'm not here to defend the fact of how much money I have and how much money I don't have. But if somebody's got a problem, please go to a court of law and prove it. I'd be happy to answer, given the due process of law. Incidentally, you talked about my assets as if you knew what my income was. I think I'm earning more from this lecture tour than all that you said I earned in the year. So you must put things together properly. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nasser, oh, gosh. and I run a, a little biotechnology company in Cambridge. Uh, my question is that uh, in New York Times, every other year there is a survey which puts Pakistan on the top five countries in the world, which are the most corrupt countries in, in the world. I wondered that uh, while you were in, uh, in Pakistan as a prime minister twice, what did you do about it? And uh, as you know, uh, to do any kind of business in any other country, all the Western countries first look uh, how easy uh, it is to do business with and uh, taking into account the corrupt officials of the government. You know, there is uh, corruption all over the third world, and I'm sure there's a bit of corruption in the West also. Uh, <laughs> for instance, it's a question of perceptions. I, myself, wanted to introduce consultants when I was Prime Minister of Pakistan because I know that every company coming to Pakistan doesn't know which door to knock on and they want to know which door to knock on. They want to hire a consultant who will fix them their appointments. But I was told that's legalized corruption. But in the United States, consultancy is part uh, of the game. So it's very difficult to differentiate what is corruption and what is not corruption. However, I will say this, that in a country like Pakistan, we often do not know that businessmen come to make profits and that it is not a sin for businessmen to make profits. Uh, in the time that I was prime minister, massive foreign investment came into Pakistan. The growth rate tripled from 2% to 6%, and people were going on about corruption. Now the government is gone, foreign investment has dried up, 70,000 people have been sacked in one year alone because the government can't afford to pay salaries. And uh, in one province, in six months alone, 86 people committed suicide because they couldn't find jobs and they couldn't support themselves. So what do we want? Do we want growth? Because if we want growth, it's not going to come with foreign aid. There is no foreign aid. It's going to come with foreign trade. And if foreign investment does come into Pakistan, the people who are going to come in are going to come in to make profits. And people are going to get rich in Pakistan and in the home country of those companies. So I think that we really need to find a balance of what we want. Do we want economic growth or not? If you want economic growth, there's going to be business and there's going to be charges of corruption. But that doesn't mean it's corruption. We countries that had public sector domination have to get used to market politics and deregulation and to private entrepreneurs who come in to make money. And we've got to appreciate that making money need not be sinful. Up here on our balcony as well. Yes, thank you very much for your stimulating talk. Uh, my name is Kath Rukawa. I'm a second year student at Kennedy School. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, I have been curious to know uh, among the uh, many leaders in the world, who has been your uh, role model in your pursuit of uh, uh, political uh, leadership uh, as the first female prime minister in your country, and how would you evaluate yourself uh, as compared to this uh, uh, your role model? Uh, well, I just love, I don't, I don't think you're going to like my answer, but I just love Margaret Thatcher. 
I was, I knew you weren't going to like it. I was at Oxford when she was leader of the opposition and my father was prime minister and he invited her over and I just looked at her and I stared at her and I said, just imagine being elected to run a country and then later on when I was in opposition, she actually became prime, prime minister and boy was she rough and tough and mean and I loved it. <laughs> Okay, one more question over here as well. Um, my name is Alexis Sinduhije. I'm from Burundi, Central Africa. Um, um, Mrs. Bhutto, I have two small questions. First one, in uh, so many underdeveloping countries, it's so difficult to, to know and to, to discover where is the power and who has the, the power. Can you explain us who and where is the power in Pakistan? This is the first question. The second one is, you said, and you are right, that the problem is uh, ignorance in so many underdeveloping countries. And you know that so many political leaders exploit this, this ignorance of people to maintain their power. How could we educate the, these people with those powerful political leaders? You know, it's a very good question about where power lies, because it lies in different places in different countries. For instance, in Pakistan, there was this great perception that power in America rested with the president. And, uh, well, I, I mean, I'm sure it does to some extent, but as far as, <laughs> as, far as we are concerned, power rested in terms of Pakistan's issues of foreign and military assistance and aid that had been blocked or money that we'd paid rested with the Congress. And it was only because I happened to have studied in America that I realized it was very important for Pakistan as a country not only to go to uh, the presidency but also to lobby in Congress, in the Senate and in the Congress. And I think that's the reason why in my first term we got 4.6 billion uh, dollars, 4.6 billion dollars of U.S. military and economic assistance. And in my second term, we got the Brown <coughs> Amendment under which Pakistan received about a billion dollars of military equipment and money. And of course, part of it was due to Mr. Mark Siegel, who's sitting in front of us and was Pakistan's chief lobbyist. He helped us really lobby. But, you know, you need to know where power rests. Um, in Pakistan, I thought power rested with the Prime Minister. <laughs> but I found out that power rests with the Prime Minister in the economic sphere, yes, power rests with the Prime Minister. In the social sphere, power rests with the Prime Minister. In the security sphere, 90% um, there would be a concurrence between the military and the security and the establishment and myself, but there'd be about a 10% difference. And I realized that power, even for a 10% difference, doesn't rest with the Prime Minister. So it differs. In some countries, power rests with the President. Some countries with the Prime Minister in some countries with the military, in some country with the Senate or with the Congress, and in some countries you find that different types of powers rest with different people. So if one is going in to give, uh, to set up, say, an educational school, one will go and do knock on one door. If one is going in uh, with a proposal for security matters, one will go and knock on another door. And perhaps for me, that has become the essence of democracy because I grew up in a dictatorship. So really, I thought, I mean, I grew up all my life as a struggle against General Zia. So it was really a question of one man having all power. And subconsciously, that affected me. And when I became prime minister, I realized that really, in a democracy, power is distributed in so many different places that one has to find the right door to knock for the right uh, subject. Yeah, Mrs. Buto. My name is Carl Miranda. I'm a Mason Fellow from the Philippines here at uh, the Kennedy School. So many parallelisms have been drawn between you and our former president, Corazon Aquino. Uh, you are both women leaders uh, whose families were victims of injustice. You both came to power in 1986 after replacing what were ostensibly uh, authoritarian regimes that perpetrated themselves in power perpetrated themselves in power. Uh, Cory Aquino, however, ushered the passing of a new constitution that limited the term of the chief executive to just six years of one, or just one term. This earned her the goodwill of the people and the moral authority over them. 
um, and she was seen as one who was trying to avoid the temptations of 